Now, I want to shift gears and talk about an important event in the history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's how the message of Mara was combined with the Three Angels' message at Battle Creek, Michigan, 125 years ago. This history has some very important spiritual lessons for all faiths, not just Seventh-day Adventists, or as we abbreviate, SDAs. To do that, we first need to look at some previous Bible stories which had instances of God acting in a miraculous way to save or inspire his people. These special supernatural actions of God were to stimulate true faith that spurs on obedience that is love-based. Just because the book of Acts ended with Paul in Rome, that does not mean that the following centuries of Christian adventures were absent of important lessons for us to study. We see in the recent 187 years of SDA church history many failures and successes in the attempts to carry out the church's commission. The reported defeats were not because God used a prophetess to help guide the church, but rather the church she was guiding was full of faulty human beings. Then and now, many reject Ellen White's writings and her ministry for various reasons. This is nothing new, because God's prophetic messages throughout the Old and New Testament seem to be met with various forms of ridicule, defiance, and malice. Ellen White did not change the subject matter of the Bible, but only expounded and helped clarify it. So let's start with some examples. The first is going back to the very beginning, where we find that Adam and Eve fell into sin quite easily. They apparently mistrusted God's clear warning not to eat of the tree in the middle of the garden. Whether it was lust of the eyes, love of the world, appetite, or simply choosing to believe a serpent's lies, the result was the same. Then next is Noah and his family, who had a great opportunity to develop a more benevolent version of mankind as they stepped off that ark. They had left behind the Hamas version defined in Genesis 6.11. But unfortunately, the curse of Canaan ensued, along with the warring family dynamics of Abraham's two sons. What a mess. What a mess. And we see it today. Later, it was the nation of Israel who blew it in both the Exodus and during the days of conquest under Joshua. Moses himself imploded very late in the game by disobeying God. He struck that rock near Petra rather than just talking to it as God asked. It is interesting how 40 years earlier he found the instructions so much easier to follow when asked to hit the rock of Horeb. I have shown previously that this great event was after a long, perilous, thirsty walk. Later, with David, Solomon, and Rehoboam, we find many grave mistakes. David had too many wives, spoiled his children, and got taken down by following through on temptation. Solomon attempted to live the perfect life with wine, women, and song, but his wisdom made him realize it was all just vanity, just chasing after the wind. I suppose the disciples did okay after Jesus left, but they were obviously supercharged by spending three and a half years, intense years with him, the creator of the universe. Then we had centuries where Christians just strove to survive. That is the dark ages. The lights were burning low. We have to give these poor folks a pass since they endured extreme persecution under papal Rome. Then, as prophesied, a religious awakening occurred all over the world. This was about 200 years ago. Some thought it was the loud cry of Revelation 18. Others called it the Great Awakening or the Midnight Cry. A bright light was shining in many parts of the world, but particularly in the northeast corner of the United States. For there, in a small part of New England, a special movement began. First, it was a Baptist preacher, William Miller who convinced many of the soon coming of Jesus. He had a date in mind, and that was a correct date, but unfortunately, the event he was connecting the date to was wrong. 
This was immediately followed by a real prophet having visions and giving guidance to form a Bible-based church. We find some interesting stories from these early days of this new church, first called Seventh-day Adventist in 1860. Within a generation, it grew to include a large Review and Herald publishing house and sanitarium at Battle Creek, Michigan. This gospel work appeared to be quite successful, but suddenly the sanitarium burnt down in 1902 along with the publishing house. Dr. Kellogg, who ran the place, talented or not, was soon kicked out of the church in 1907. Most Adventists don't know anything about this Battle Creek theatrical drama or are ashamed of the various details. Ellen White explained that the fire was because the leaders were not consecrated and God wanted the work to spread out. The publishing and health work was to disperse and expand to many other parts of the country and to the world. It was not to be just one big mega complex that Battle Creek had become. Many have looked at this fascinating American story from a worldly point of view and found much entertainment within it. But that's not what I want to do. Anthony Hopkins and Matthew Broderick already did that in a really dumb movie about the sanitarium where Hopkins played Dr. Kellogg. It's called The Road to Wellville, 1994. No, I want to examine things on the basis of what healthful living evangelism should be and draw some comparisons to the original message, the health message that was preached at Mara in 1446 BC. If there is a standard to judge this complex event, it must be the Bible. For indeed, that was the ultimate guidebook used by the newly minted SDA church leadership 150 years ago. The story began with Ellen White, church prophetess, and her husband James White mentoring a brilliant young man named John Kellogg. They took him in because there was an urgent need for talented medical leadership. He was plucked from a large family that was quite active in the church. Largely self-educated, John began to help in the church's print shop at age 12. As a rising star protégé, he was admired and mentored by the Whites. I suspect their son Willie, who was two years younger than John, and who also helped in his father's print shop, became quite jealous. The Whites' admiration grew as they paid for John to go on and receive training in teaching, hydropathic medicine, vegetarianism, and finally, he earned a formal medical degree conferred in 1875 at the age of 23. The following year, he became director of the Battle Creek Sanitarium and remained there until he died at the age of 91 in 1943. If we looked at, at the trajectory of his life, it was mostly going up until the sanitarium burnt down. Shortly after this paranormal catastrophe, his well-known non-biblical beliefs made the church have to disfellowship him. Soon, a long, protracted legal fight began with his younger brother, Will, over cornflakes. And finally, the San, as they called it, ended up in bankruptcy. We now know that refined grain substituted for whole grain is the primary cause of heart disease, hypertension, stroke, and dementia. Ellen White was correct in declining the patent to cornflakes because it is a refined grain product. The church would have been responsible for millions of premature heart attacks in the last century. Adventists should be proud of her stance and not ashamed. Ronald L. Numbers was wrong. We should be proud that the work spread to Washington, D.C. and Loma Linda, California. A fine medical school, Loma Linda University continues today and is doing great research on healthful living that is recognized worldwide. That you're dedicating a statue like that, the 100 year anniversary of the medical school. I think I was born right here 53 years ago and now my own son's graduated medical school. It's just too amazing to be part of something like that. I personally do not agree 
with church members that praised John Kellogg for his medical achievements and his fame at the sanitarium. Doing that is no different than praising Jeffrey Epstein for his skills in investment banking and entertaining high-level political celebrities on his island. Or as one of my patients once told me, a funny elderly lady from Denmark who was once a Nazi sympathizer, she said, Dr. Elwe, you need to understand Hitler had some great ideas. He just went too far. Dr. Kellogg also had many good ideas, and he too took them too far. A recent lecture at the Michigan camp meeting, Dr. Brian Strayer clearly tells us how evil John Harvey was and how he rejected the church, didn't listen to Ellen White, and eventually rejected Jesus himself. His few close friends uh, heard him say that he no longer believed in the stories of Job and Jonah in the Bible, that he denied the virgin birth, he denied the divinity of Jesus, he denied the need of humans for atonement, for Jesus' atonement at the cross. All right, so this was the great schism, the great Adventist schism of 1902. Let's give these events a religious theme, a pattern to follow, so we can discuss and ponder it better. I believe there are two models we can use to describe the Kellogg debacle. The first is the easiest to understand because it is in the simple terms of good and evil, or as Adventists prefer, the great controversy. A view that realizes hidden behind the scenes there is an epic battle between Christ and Satan. Pop culture uses this theme quite often, and it generates great box office success. In this model, John Kellogg takes the role of Lucifer, a perfect being that started out good and was welcome in the highest courts of heaven, or in Kellogg's case, was in the inner circle of the uppermost leaders of the church. There, unbeknownst to those that appointed him, he was harboring sin in his heart and with time turned to the dark side. Indeed, Kellogg was a cloaked pantheist. So you have the ancient mystery religions of Babylon, Egypt, India, Persia, Greece, and they were all forms of pantheism. Do we find pantheism in the papal encyclicals? Yes, very much so. Right. A demonic teaching that Timothy warned us about in 1 Timothy 4.1 where he said, in the latter days, some will desert the faith and occupy themselves with deceiving spirits and demonic teachings. That's what pantheism was. So Kellogg went right back into Babylon. And it wasn't just pantheism. He was a eugenics fan. Someone who would vote democratic and have a pro-abortion stance. Kellogg crossed the line by advancing some very disturbing views on sexual activity. Like Satan, his pride was quite evident, and he no doubt saw himself as a little god leading the flocks who came to the sanitarium. This top position gave him prestige and put him front and center where the rich and famous would come and stoke his ego. He would dress in white from head to toe like an angel of light, predating the future Colonel Sanders, showing off at the front table with the cream of society. He was known to put down anyone that questioned him, or stymie and hinder any worker that might attract more attention than him. Soon, this growing power and pride led Kellogg to openly disagree with church leadership, to forsake Bible truth, and to give his support to the eugenics movement. Thus, by 1907, he had to be literally cast out of the church. Just as Lucifer was cast out and took one-third of the angels with him, so did Kellogg. He took a substantial amount of educated healthcare workers with him to continue to run his sanitarium kingdom apart from the SDA church. The less educated church members went on to do what they could in other parts of the country. The split sadly began a need to question one's views concerning the writings of Ellen White. He did not believe her and did not take her advice. The church now has included her ministry 
with the 26 fundamental beliefs, but thankfully it's not a litmus test that could prevent baptism. I personally get the concern, but if in, indeed converts are shown that her writings are in total agreement with, with the Bible, then a positive opinion of what the Bible says is the only thing necessary. Furthermore, the original hard stance of the church to quit smoking and drinking before baptism seems petty since unrestrained appetite is ignored. It's given a pass. The second model is a comparison of the Kellogg era to the government theocracy of ancient Israel. Remember, they were to be a royal priesthood to help redeem the world, first through their example and also by preaching the soon coming Messiah. Like Israel, many church leaders 170 years ago didn't get along with Kellogg. There was also internal disunity on some projects due to ego, favoritism, and pride. Just as in the time of Eli, the church began to realize it needed a kingpin figure to take the helm, to be the boss, the hefa, like most large corporations. The key point in this historical analysis was that the greatest problems were not with the common folk, the laity. No, the problem was with the leadership. The early church laity in ancient Israel could clearly see that both Eli and Samuel's sons were so corrupt that a secular government had to be a better option than what they had. Pastors today often preach this point wrong when discussing how it was sinful Israel that wanted a king as if Israel was covetous of other nations. No, Israel was sick of church leadership corruption, their greed and pride. They were fed up with paying the bill, but getting little in return. The early church was experiencing these same issues in the buildup of the eventual famous sanitarium. The pastors of the day did not support John financially in his work, nor did they help him by example. In fact, they went out of their way to serve tea, coffee, and to eat large quantities of meat at church gatherings. Willie White actually stole John's woman. But in 1876, Willie White stole his girl. And Willie married Mary. And on the rebound, just months later, John wed Ella Eaton a brilliant Seventh-day Baptist who had graduated from Alfred University in southwestern New York. This grave event precipitated John marrying a non-Adventist woman that could have been the primary source of his downfall. When Ella's Baptist pastor visited in the Kellogg home, he and the doctor often engaged in friendly debates about theology. Pastor Jones often teased Kellogg that Adventists had too narrow a view of God. They pictured him as a being sitting on a throne in a sanctuary somewhere in heaven. Instead, Jones said, God is a power, a force, an influence that pervades all nature. He's in the tree. He's in the grass. He's in the very food that we eat. Furthermore, Conference President A.G. Daniels openly starved Kellogg of financial support, creating much animosity. These same ministers who wanted to control the health and medical work he had built up, he claimed, did not want to finance it adequately. And since the health teachings were indeed the right arm of the message, Kellogg asserted that it should be generously supported, not only from free will offerings, but also from church ties. That view brought him squarely into opposition with General Conference President Arthur G. Daniels. Elder Daniels refused his repeated request to use tithe money to establish new sanitariums in England and Mexico, to pay the salaries of medical personnel, and to liquidate the debts on Kellogg's medical institutions. As a result, those two men often clashed. Pastors should always look inward and do some real soul searching when a church wants to jump ship to be more like the world. 
The example of Christ in this situation is that God, Jesus himself, took the responsibility of being the source of the people's abandonment. See 1 Samuel 8 verse 7. Scripture clearly says they wanted worldly justice over the justice of Eli and Samuel's sons. 1 Samuel 8 5. If pastors are the problem, then subsequent judgment to this kind of stuff can be severe. Eli's sons died in the Battle of Aphek on the same day as some 30,000 other foot soldiers of Israel that also perished. You see that in 1 Samuel 2.34 and 1 Samuel 4 verse 10. Eli then fell over and died at age 98 upon hearing the news. Willie White's wife, Mary, who he snatched from Kellogg, died age 33 of tuberculosis. Later, it was Samuel's own sons that had to be removed from power due to taking bribes and perverting justice, 1 Samuel 8, 3. The key is finding a leader who keeps God's law. So to do that, the prophet of God went to the then house of Jesse, who had many sons. Likewise, in our era, that special house was John Preston Kellogg. He had six children from his first wife and 11 from his second. The fifth child from the second batch was picked because he appeared to have the most promise, but may have been the run to the litter. Childhood sickness may have stunted his growth since John reached a height of only five foot four. In the Bible story, David was not picked by Samuel because Samuel wanted to pick the older, tall, and handsome brothers. God did the picking by looking at David's heart and told Samuel to anoint him as he returned home from tending sheep. I'm sure it's up for debate, but the choosing of John Harvey was most likely from outward appearance. He was reportedly smart, 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. Ellen White did have a dream about him, but that dream only indicated that he would do great things for the work of the church. So in this model, John Kellogg becomes a type of David, or Saul, leading the work to success, but then his heart was not right. He had a downfall, similar to David's son Solomon years later. The two stories are separated by 2,850 years, but are very similar when compared. Solomon's and Kellogg's kingdom became infiltrated with idolatry, worldly pleasures, or love of the world, and a power struggle. Catastrophe struck both kingdoms and they split in two, never to recover their formal, former glory. If the early SDA church and sanitarium succeeded as Solomon and his kingdom did briefly, all the nations would be blessed. Which brings me to the gospel message of Mara, a message that John Kellogg split in two. He precipitated a great schism where the everlasting gospel connected to a health message became simply works-based health care. Another change was to discourage Adventist doctrines from being promoted on the sanitarium premises. He also forced the new stockholders to sign a declaration of principles in which they agreed that the sanitarium would be an undenominational, non-sectarian, humanitarian, and philanthropic institution. When worried church leaders questioned him about these new policies, he stated deviously that all they really meant was that the new association would not discriminate against any patient on the basis of their beliefs. People were taught that your own works, your own efforts under the direction of the sand is salvation. Yes, with Satan in his heart, John killed off the first angel's message that proclaims the everlasting gospel. We know this because John plotted seven years before the great fire to arrest control of the sand from the SDA church. The doctor's penchant for deceitfulness and devious practices emerged in his relationship with the Adventist church. Long before the 30-year charter of Battle Creek Sanitarium expired in 1897, Kellogg began laying plans to legally reorganize it under the umbrella of the Michigan Sanitarium and Benevolent Association so that he could reduce the church's control over his institution. 
In 1905, Kilo confided to a friend that he had anticipated the probability of an eventual break between himself and the church, and he had begun preparing for that break as early as 1895. Once that was accomplished, he made it solely a worldly institution. His motivations for continuing this health ministry was pride, power, and to gain more profits via his books and products. His vicious fight over cornflakes with his younger brother Will showed that he had just as much disdain for his own dedicated, helpful brother as the church. Now we have medicine in today just like the sand, all about big profits, where the patients remain sick, able to continue their harmful habits. The sin problem that brought many to the sand with their destructive habits arising from disease-based affliction and guilt got swept under the rug. I love this Ellen White quote concerning this problem. When the gospel is received in its purity and power, it is a cure for the maladies that originated in sin. The Son of Righteousness arises with healing in his wings. Malachi 4.2 Not all this world bestows can heal a broken heart, or impart peace of mind, or remove care, or banish disease. Fame, genius, talent, all are powerless to gladden the sorrowful heart, or to restore the wasted life. The life of God in the soul is man's only hope. Ministry of Healing Our health system today is imploding from this hands-off secular approach. This is why it is imperative that we get back to the Mara message. Sinners need a grace-fueled relationship with our loving God who came to redeem us. He wants to be our healer and our personal physician. One of Christ's initial miracles was to heal the paralytic, both of physical disease and of his guilt, by forgiving his sins. This potent combination of love and grace inspires victory over sinful habits. As our Creator, He knows what is best, and thus gave many important health principles to follow. The first message was to be a vegetarian, that is, eat fruits, nuts, and grains, Genesis 1.29. The next message was that if healthy foods are not available, that is, in cases of famine, travel, war, you may eat meat. We're just to be careful to eat clean animals. So Noah and his family saw seven pairs of clean animals go on the ark. There was 14 chickens, 14 cows, etc. They would have enough to eat. Genesis 7-2 Centuries later, Leviticus chapter 11 clarified this further so that anyone could determine what is clean and unclean. Daniel and his friends knew and believed this knowledge, so they didn't want meat. Unlike the pastors of Kellogg's days, and most Adventists today, I believe only 50% of the church is vegetarian. No, they wanted a diet high in vegetables, legumes, grain, and water. This diet was put to the test in Babylon for 10 days and reportedly worked very well. That's Daniel 1, 8-21. Interestingly, a recent report came up in one of the liver journals that showed inflamed fatty livers found in obese children normalized in 10 days if the children quit eating sugary soda pop and chips. The body can heal from the ravages of fatty liver, or steatohepatitis, which is America's and the world's current epidemic. To do that, a lifestyle change is imperative. 90% of patients with this disease can be cured with just losing 10% of body weight or more. The Mara experience is a simple diet, lots of exercise, sunlight, and a relationship with God. The message of Mara needs to be put front and center. A solid relationship with God in the setting of a loving, supportive church will help. But the old pioneer belief in tough love along with harnessing willpower should not be overlooked. It is not salvation by dietary works through the sand, but salvation through knowing Jesus in his healing wings. Let us meditate on these stories of the past, learn from them, and then go on to live out the true mission of God's church in these last days.